Oh, good evening, everyone. Um, welcome to tonight's event. My name is Ara McCauley. I'm the Artistic Director of Kingston Writers Fest, and I'm delighted to welcome you to an evening with Jen Gunter. This is the third in our series of pre-festival events, and thank you for joining us. I'd like to begin by acknowledging that the land on which the festival customarily takes place and where I stand tonight is the traditional territory of the Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee peoples. We gratefully acknowledge these Indigenous nations for their ongoing guardianship of this land. We agree to peaceably share in responsibility for stewardship of this land, its waters, and all of its biodiversity. All those who come to live and work here are responsible for honoring these relationships in a spirit of peace, friendship, and respect. Today is also National Indigenous Peoples, Indigenous Peoples Day, a day recognizing and celebrating the culture and contributions of the First Nations, Inuit, and Métis Indigenous Peoples of Canada. The state, the summer solstice, carries a cultural significance for many Indigenous peoples and communities and is a day on which they celebrate their his heritage. I would encourage you to take a moment today to reflect on and acknowledge the history of Indigenous peoples in what is now Canada. I'll also wish a happy Pride Month to all of our two-spirit, lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer, questioning, intersex, and asexual readers and writers. So in just a moment, I'm going to introduce tonight's guest, but first some quick housekeeping. If you have not already signed up for Kingston Writers Fest newsletter, I'd high re highly recommend that you do so. This year, we are doing our festival lineup a little differently, so you'll want to stay tuned to make sure you don't miss out. As a little treat for joining us tonight, though, I can tell you we have some local favorites, including Stephen Heighton and Helen Humphreys. Thomas King's back with a new thriller. We celebrate the final installment in Eden Robinson's Trickster Trilogy. Canlit heavy hitters Camilla Gibb and Omar el Akkad come to us with long-awaited new novels. Francophone author Jocelyn Saussier explores small town drama. And Amber Dawn looks at the toll that art takes on its creators. I'd like to thank the Canada Council, Canada Heritage, Ontario Arts Council, and City of Kingston and Kingston Arts Council for their ongoing support of the festival, as well as Visit Kingston. Thanks too to Novel Idea Bookstore for supporting tonight's presentation. Dr. Jen Gunter's new novel, the Man or novel book, The Menopause Manifesto, Own Your Health with Facts and Feminism, is now on sale at Novel Idea. Um, you can pick up uh, copies by phone, online, or finally in person at 156 Princess Street. This event is about 35 minutes long and it's going to be followed by an extended audience Q&A. So feel free to type your questions into the question box at any point during the event. Now it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Jen Gunter. Dr. Gunter is an obstetrician and gynecolo gynecologist with nearly three decades of experience as a vulvar and vaginal diseases expert. She's the author of the number one bestseller, The Vagina Bible, and has been called Twitter's resident gynecologist, the internet's OBGYN, and a fierce advocate for women's health. She writes two regular columns for the New York Times called The Cycle, and You Asked, and has written for a broad range of outlets from academic publications to The New Republic, Chatelaine, Self, The Cut, and many more. The Menopause Manifesto is garnering lots of praise and has already landed on the bestseller list in Canada and the New York Times. Um, and it's uh, being praised by ordinary women and professionals alike and has been called the new it book for women who want to prepare for or understand what menopause is and isn't. Please welcome Jen Gunter. Hi, well, thank you so much. I'm so thrilled to be here. Um, I, uh, you know, everybody knows that I'm, well, I hope everybody knows that I'm from Winnipeg originally, and I did my uh, training in Western or at Western, which I guess I heard now they call Western University and not University of Western Ontario. So I just like that to get, um, so anyway, yes, I'm here to talk about, um, the menopause manifesto, which I have a book with a different, uh, cover. I have the American version, um, because of all the pandemic and shipping and everything. My, um, Canadian version hasn't come to me yet. So just a few housekeeping notes from my end, I'm having some construction done, which isn't quite finished. So I'm hoping it's going to be quiet. They're, um, they're wrapping up. I found out that my part of my house had to be reframed. So that's, um, that was a bit of a surprise. And uh, so if there's a little bit of noise, I apologize. And also my cat Luna has just jumped onto my lap. She's uh, usually quite quiet during these things, but you might see a little head poke up 
and she might want to say hi um, because she seems to know whenever I'm going to be on the computer talking to someone as opposed to just on the computer writing. So not quite sure how she does that, but she uh, rules the house with her um, all six pounds of fat love and she certainly bosses around the 80 pound lab uh, a lot. So I wanted to start by explaining, you know, why this book, how this book came to be. Because, uh, you know, it's often one of the questions I get asked when, um, when I talk. And I think that it's, a, it's, it's a, a good introduction into really the book and to everything else. And so the reason this came about was when I was on, you know, the Vagina Bible Tour and you're, you know, one-on-one -on -one with the audiences or you are with the audience and you're getting lots of questions. Almost always, after a few questions about the vagina or vulva or women's health care, there would be a question about menopause. And once there was one question about menopause and not necessarily related to the vulva and vagina, there would be more and more and more. And it seemed that everywhere I went, there were very similar questions about menopause. And many people referenced work that I necessarily wouldn't recommend reading. And even when I did interviews with journalists, they would have questions about menopause. You know, I would casually mention maybe I was on the estrogen patch and all of a sudden that's all people wanted to talk about as if, you know, I was doing something dangerous, like, you know, um, I don't know, like smoking on the school steps. And that was kind of the mystique or mystery that, you know, that estrogen replacement, you know, had. And so I really started thinking that there was something there that obviously there was a knowledge gap. And it seemed that maybe creating a space to talk about the vulva and vagina, which is a taboo, created a space to talk about the greatest taboo of all, an aging woman's body. And someone said something to me, and I wish I could remember when it was, if it was a tweet that I read or someone you know, saying something at a talk, but they said that menopause was lonely, that there was no culture. And that really stuck with me. Um, and it's true everywhere you look, you know, even though half the population has menopause, if you look on the cover of so-called women's magazines, it's very rarely addressed in, in sort of any kind of way. Uh, we rarely hear things about incontinence or osteoporosis or things that, you know, really affect, uh, you know, your lifespan and your quality of life. And so I really thought that there was this really great need that clearly, you know, there was this rising sort of tide of disinformation about menopause supplements and things like that. And, uh, and in addition, there was this knowledge gap. And so I hope to sort of step in and sort of explain some of the culture and the interesting historical background behind menopause, as well as, um, as give people the information to help guide them through uh, their menopause transition afterwards, or really even arm people to sort of to have the information years before menopause starts so they can do what they want to do with, you know, to try to improve their health through their menopause transition. And so that's kind of how the book came about. And so one of the first questions that, um, you know, that I sort of tackle in the book is, you know, just, you know, where did the word menopause come from? I get asked that, you know, really quite a lot. And people are often, you know, wonder by it because, you know, pause, did the ancient Greeks not know that period stopped? Like, what's up with that? Or menopause, why does it have the word men in it? You know, so these are, these are questions that people have asked along the way. You know, and it turns out that menopause is a relatively new term and it came about actually the final iteration of the word, we're in the 200th anniversary. Yeah, so that's kind of interesting, 1821. Um, so what happened was before the 1800s, people used a variety of terms. They used something called the climacteric, which just means kind of like change or phase of life. And it also can apply to men. They also used the cessation, which would you know, be in relation to cessation of periods. And, um, and they also just referred to it as C, as in for cessation. And so, um, and so those are, you know, the, you know, the, the terms that were used. So along came a man called uh, Dr. Charles Desjardins, who uh, was a physician of the day. And uh, he wrote a treatise on what he called menopause. Now, it initially started as uh, la menopause, 
And the reason he chose that name is because he looked to a Greek, which is what lots of people did back in the day for, you know, for naming things. And uh, the, the menes is from menes, which is for month or the monthlies, right? Which was a very common term for periods back in the day. And pausi, which is for Greek for a cessation or to stop. And so it became menes pausi. And pausi, becomes menopause, became menopause, menopause, and that was all in French, but it's because pause and pause sound similar. That's how it came about. So it had nothing to do with being a pause. Pause just sounds like pause. And so I thought that was actually really interesting. And I think it's a really interesting sort of introduction into actually how we talk about menopause or how we talk about, you know, women's bodies specifically, because a lot of the language that's been assigned to conditions that affect women or women's bodies specifically actually come with a lot of baggage. So the words that we use, you know, affect how we think. And when you look at, for example, the hymen, well, that's named after the Greek god of marriage, right? no implications for anything there, right? Um, but, uh, you know, if you look at the pedenda, which is the external part of the genitalia, typically applied to those who have vulvas and vaginas, the Latin root for pedendum is pedere, which is to shame. Right. So it's really interesting when you think about that language and how it's applied to menopause. So throughout the years in medical textbooks, the terms such as ovarian failure and loss of hormones have been used to describe menopause. But that's actually really inaccurate because the ovaries were always destined to stop functioning. Menopause is a planned event, just like the end of puberty is a planned event or the start of puberty is a planned event. And, you know, medically, we wouldn't say that, that oh, well, you have loss of childhood to describe somebody's puberty, right? We wouldn't do that at all. Uh, but with menopause, we frequently do that, or we have historically. And that really sort of represents these sort of patriarchal pejorative descriptions. Uh, because since basically the beginning of time in Western medicine, menopause has been viewed as being a flaw because being a woman was considered a flaw. So that's an important sort of starting point. So, you know, initially, um, you know, the Greeks believed that every cell in a woman's body was too moist, that there's too much liquid in every cell. That was one of our many physical faults. And the, re the way we got rid of this extra moisture was through menstruation, right? So menstruation help, helped you get rid of a toxic buildup of fluids that your pathetic female physiology couldn't handle. So what happens if you can no longer menstruate? Well, obviously those humors and, and toxins and whatnot start to accumulate in your body. And so if you're a 60 year old woman and you hurt your shoulder, well, it's because of the toxic buildup of humors in your body. And if you're a 60 year old man who hurt your body, well, it was hurt your shoulder. Well, it's obviously because you were pulling weeds the day before, right? So that's basically everything that happened to women um, after their final period uh, was because of their uterus, because of course, right? Uh, and, you know, the way we talked about menopause, even into the 50s and 60s, and even 70s and even later reflects a lot of that negative language, that sort of description of ovarian failure or loss. And so I really wanted to explain why that matters to people in the book. The other thing that, um, that I really wanted to explain, which I go into great detail in the book, is this idea that menopause is, um, is not a modern invention. So that's also another lie that we're told. Uh, we're told that, oh, well, you know, menopause only exists because of, you know, the grace of, of vaccination and sanitation and modern medicine. And, you know, whenever anything sounds off to me, I think, you know, would we ever describe, you know, a man's body that way? Would we ever say, huh, only through the grace of modern medicine and vaccination, men are now living long enough to have erectile dysfunction? Well, of course, we would never say that. So whenever it sounds odd, if you flip the script, it's always important to take a deeper dive. And this is a, you know, 
probably an untruth that's been around for some time, but was really popularized in the 50s, uh, was this idea that, um, that menopause was never supposed to exist. The ancient Greeks knew the average age of menopause. They knew it was, you know, late 40s, early 50s. That's what, you know, what they have documented. And obviously, people have to be living beyond 50 to be able to come up with that calculation, right? Uh, and, you know, there are, you know, many cases of, you know, physicians starting to describe, you know, what we know as menopause, you know, in the literature in the 1500s. So obviously they were aware that it, you know, that it happened. In the 1700s, there was the first dissertation written on, you know, what we now call menopause. Again, if no one was experiencing it, that certainly wouldn't have been the case. And obviously the 1700s is you know, pre-vaccination, pre-modern sanitation, pre-antibiotics, pre-germ theory, you know, that's pre-everything in modern medicine. So I think it's important to sort of knock down those myths. So then people say, well, why do we have menopause? And that's something that I really took sort of a deep dive into, and it's called the grandmother hypothesis. And what this tells us is that, you know, menopause actually evolved for a reason. It's not just some weird fluke. And it gets back again to this um, negative way of looking at women's bodies, right? That there's something wrong with them. That there's, so if you look at menopause through a lens of ovarian failure, it's a lot of a different, it's a, it gives you a completely different perspective than if you flip the script. And instead of comparing ovaries to testicles, because comparing the two is like comparing the heart and the liver, they're different organs. They're, they're meant to do different things. You shouldn't be comparing them. Compare our ovaries to the ovaries of our closest living relative, chimps. And it turns out chimps actually have very similar ovaries to us. They ovulate like we do. They release the same number of eggs. They, um, they have a winding down of their ovarian function in their 40s, just like we do. But the difference is Chimps die and we keep on living. And so if you look to the animal kingdom, you see that most animals, most mammals actually die shortly after reproduction. They live, basically they live to reproduce when they can't reproduce anymore, they die. And you also have to look though at most animals. Most animals don't deliver a creature, a baby that is incredibly dependent for years and years and years on its mother. So we're different in that way. And so the question isn't really, why do ovaries fail? And that's looking at it if you compare ovaries to testicles. The question is, why did humans keep on living beyond their ovarian function? And so all of a sudden, you're not looking at the question through a lens of ovarian failure, you're looking at the question through the lens of our ancestral you know, women's survival. And what the grandmother hypothesis tells us, and there's a lot of good evidence to support it, is that our ancestral grandmothers, there would have been one or two who did live beyond their ovarian function, maybe a few years, who knows, but they lived beyond their ovarian function. And they would have been useful to their offspring. They would have been helpful in some way. And by being helpful, that allowed their offspring to have more children because humans require a lot of caretaking. So it requires we require shelter, so we don't have fur, it requires gathering food, gathering clean water, all of these things have to happen. And if a mother is immediately postpartum, she is gonna have a harder time protecting her family. If there's an extra pair of hands for food gathering, for all the other things that are required, that's going to help pass on those genetics. And so that would just keep, you would keep passing along the genetics for longevity because the people who had help would have more children. And so it's really fascinating. That really flips the script. Instead of saying that all women become useless over the age of 50, that grandmothers are weak and frail and, you know, look at how women are generally represented in the cinema and, you know, television as they age. They're, they're not, you know, they're not superheroes. They're not action stars. They're, you know, ancient lady detectives or matriarchs who are, you know, jealous or vindictive, you know, we very rarely get to see um, sort of active, you know, vibrant, you know, you know, women who are, you know, clearly of age to be menopause, right? We rarely get to see that. So 
you know, there's data um, that tells us that, you know, ancestrally and even very recently um, in the 1700s, that grandmothers were actually very effective at, at contributing to survival. And the closer a grandmother lived to her offspring, the more offspring they had. And this makes perfect sense because you can only be helpful to your offspring if your fertility has already wound down. If you're a grandmother and you're still reproducing, you're 52, 53, and you've got two and three-year-olds or newborns, you can't be helpful to your 25-year-old because you need that help yourself, right? So the most effective grandmother isn't just a few years away from having her own reproduction. She's several years away for her own reproduction. So that explains, you know, this sort of winding down of fertility. And that also explains the value of grandmothers. And what's really fascinating, which is, you know, discussed also in the book, is that the only other mammals to have menopause that we know about so far are toothed whales. And the most common are killer whales. And um, yeah, I know orchids, right? I think that's so cool. I was orchids. And what we know is that when there's a grandmother, mother, grand or grand calf sort of triad, that the grand calf is much more likely to survive than there isn't, isn't a grandmother. And what's really fascinating about killer whales is that male killer whales die around the age of 50 so that they don't contribute anything obviously um, to the pod beyond that maybe they're competitive for food or you know who knows um, but I just think it's really fascinating that when you start looking at menopause as a sign of survival how many other sort of um, things that you start to see about it um, when you look at it as sort of a sign of weakness or failure so um you know, that sort of that weakness or failure has sort of been reflected, I think, in a lot of, you know, what's happened to, you know, in our society about discussions of menopause. I alluded to how, you know, there really aren't, you know, there are very few representations in cinema, TV, the arts, or popular ones anyway, right? Um, you know, of, of women over, you know, over the age of 50. I'm always reminded of how in Forrest Gump, uh, Tom Hanks and Sally Field were basically the same age, and yet she played his mother. And there's all kinds of examples of, um, you know, young, incredibly attractive Hollywood stars, um, being too old to play the wife of the 50 year old, like at the age of 35, right? Like that's an incredibly skewed dynamic and something that's just, um, you know, not, uh, you know, not okay to sort of, um, uh, you know, present, um, present to the population, but yet that's, you know, that's what makes money. Um, so I think it's really important that we, we think of sort of menopause in terms of a survival advantage than in terms of a negative. Now, it's very true that many people have symptoms in menopause and that because so many people haven't had sort of access to the type of medical care that can help them or even the type of information that can help them sort out their symptoms that, you know, that we've had a uh, you know, a lot of, I would say, negative press about menopause. And so I want to read um, the first, uh, just sort of the introduction to the book, the first few pages, just um, so you can kind of uh, sort of see the start. So if menopause were on Yelp, it would have one star. This establishment has temperature control issues, drenching heat followed by terrible chills, defies the laws of thermodynamics, would not recommend. Awful, awful, awful. Bleeding was scheduled, but was rebooked without notification. So arrived three weeks later than expected while I was in an Uber and I flooded the car. The driver gave me a terrible review. The sex was dry. And it's no surprise. Most women have no idea what to expect when they are no longer expecting a period. And it's uniquely awful and disempowering to not understand what is happening to your body and why. Menopause is like being sent on a canoe trip with no guidebook and only a vague idea where you're headed. Although the expectation is it's awful. There will be no advice on how to get there or how to manage any of the obstacles such as rapids. That is if any exist. Who knows? Have fun figuring it out. Good times. Oh, and don't write. No one wants to hear about your journey or what it's like when you arrive. Fear? Check. Uncertainty? Check. Medical ramifications? Check. Unpleasant symptoms? Check. Social irrelevance? No wonder menopause receives such awful reviews. The culture of silence about menopause in our patriarchal society is something to behold. Menopause doesn't even rate the shame that society gives the vulva and vagina. Apparently there is nothing of lower value than an aging woman's body. 
And many in our society treat menopause not as a phase of life, but rather as a phase of death, sort of a pre-death. What little that is spoken about menopause is often viewed through the lens of ovarian failure, the assertion that menopause is a disease that exists because women and their ovaries are weak. The only grounds for this are the fact that men don't experience menopause, but comparing women and men in this way is the same as comparing the liver with the heart. The liver isn't weak or diseased because it doesn't beat like the heart, and women aren't diseased because their ovaries stop making estrogen. So, you know, one thing that, that I found as I went through menopause was having all the knowledge about how your body changes, why it's changing, what's happening to your body, actually was really made it a lot less frightening. And that's one of the things that I really hoped to bring to this book was that a lot of what happens is women come in because they're very worried about symptoms and they don't actually, they think what's happening to their body isn't normal. Now, normal doesn't mean it shouldn't be treated if it's bothersome to you, but sometimes people hear that this is what's expected and they're like, oh, okay, then why well, I, I don't actually want any treatment um, because the treatment actually sounds more bothersome to me than the symptoms. And that's really the power of having the knowledge about your body, knowing what's normal, what's abnormal, knowing then what if it's bothering you enough that you want treatment, what the risks and the benefits are of the treatment. So you can weigh them individually and make decisions for you. And so there's a lot in the book about different therapies for different medical conditions. And I really also took what I hope is an interesting deep dive into some of the history of treatments for menopause, um, because that's sort of part of the culture, you know, when, um, when, when, again, I really, that idea that there's no culture in menopause is something that really stuck with me. And I thought, you know, how can I create that? If I want to write about a treatment, like I've never seen historically to put it in perspective for, for women, how am I going to do that? And so during the pandemic, when, um, when lots of people were taking on, on things like trying to grow, trying to get a sourdough starter going, it didn't really work for me at all. I killed it quickly. I'm terrible with plants. And so I guess yeast is pretty much the same thing. Um, so when I was doing that, I decided that I was going to see what I could find online to sort of help give me the culture of menopause. So um, one of my uh, greatest finds is I'm going to do a little show and tell is this is a book from the 1850s um, written by Edward Tilt, who uh, was an OBGYN of the time and certainly for his day, not misogynistic. I mean, obviously compared to today, yes. But for the day, actually, um, it was quite a refreshing read. And it was really interesting, um, you know, to you know, to read about all of the treatments that were used, which were generally pretty awful. And so, whenever anyone holds out, you know, ancient therapies, I always like to point out that actually ancient therapies sucked pretty much because people didn't really know. Um, lots of the treatments that were recommended, you know, both by you know in the apothecaries and by physicians were things like lead in the vagina and ice cold douches, um, and even like back in the day, like um, they used to recommend, you know, what I suppose Gwyneth Paltrow calls vaginal steaming, but they actually called womb fumigation, right? And, uh, you know, it's always interesting to me when people cherry pick from ancient, you know, ancient texts, what they cherry pick and, uh, you know, or if it's just a bad game of telephone and they come up with this concept of vaginal steaming, you know, based on something someone once read. Well, if you go back actually to the sources and you read sort of, you know, the translations of the original documents or the, you know, the people who've written about them, you know, vaginal fumigation or womb fumigation in the time of the Greeks, you know, what they did was they, they used substances that they thought would either add moisture to the tissue or take away. Obviously a concept that we don't use today. They were prescribing remedies based on a woman's body having too much fluid in its tissues. Okay, so that's something that we know is not true. And so any herbs and things were recommended based on that. And, you know, one of the most common, you know, recipes for womb fumigation um, did involve herbs and such, but um, the part of the recipe that's always missed out is it involved, um, you know, a, a killing a dog and disemboweling it and stuffing it with the herbs. And that's actually what you burned. To, um, to get the fumes. And depending on if you needed it to be too, if your tissue was too moist or too dry, that's how you decided to use a puppy versus a dog, 
right? So it puts those ancient therapies in perspective, um, you know, about them. And it's true, they used a lot of vaginal therapies back in the day. Um, in fact, if you look at the Hippocratic uh, corpus, about 80% of the remedies are related to the menstrual cycle. And this is because they were really obsessed with the menstrual cycle because, well, they didn't know a lot about medicine, um, but they knew that, that when periods stopped, it was a loss of, that often it signified a loss of fertility and that was a big deal because not being fertile was a big deal, right? And also when you became menopausal and your period stopped, then all those toxins built up. So that's why they kind of had this obsession with sort of vaginal treatments and pulses and things, not because they were particularly effective, but because A, they didn't, you know, they didn't have the knowledge base that we had. But some other things, so besides this book that I got, and I actually um, have a few other, other textbooks from the 1800s, I actually found some really interesting therapies online. So one of the common, um, I would say, myths of sort of the, uh, the quote, quote, natural medicine movement is that nasty pharmaceutical companies came along and kicked out mom and pop hormone makers, I guess, for lack of a better word. And that we, if we could just go back to the natural time in the 20s and 30s, when, you know, people gave people natural hormones for their menopause, it'd just be better. And obviously that idea comes from people that have no idea what they're talking about. Because the, the estrogens that they used in the 20s and 30s um, weren't purified in the way that we know at all. They weren't purified because hadn't been actually identified, but the, they were actually just um, extracts from hog ovaries or extracts of amniotic fluid. And a common one was thialin, which is an extract of hog ovaries. And obviously it would have produced wide swings um, in, uh, in hormone levels. Um, and thialin was believed to be um, estrone actually. And what I found on Etsy was, you probably won't be able to see it, but I actually found a vial of it. Isn't that cool? Somebody was going through their pharmacy that their dad, old, their grandfather had or something. And they had all these medicines in the back. And so I have a, a vial of thialin. Um, I also have an empty bottle of Menagen, which was an old uh, remedy uh, that had estrogen in it back in the day. Um, we would have no idea really like how much was in it. And even, Avon sold estrogen. I know this is Avon hormone cream. It's filled with estrogen and you were supposed to put it on your face. There really aren't any sort of estrogen receptors, you know, on your face. So um, not really something we'd recommend, but yeah, Avon was in the estrogen business. Everybody was. Um, and this is really from the time when um, estrogen meant feminine forever. And uh, that was actually a book. I also have a copy of it. I didn't bring it out for show and tell. Um, from the early 1960s that basically advanced the idea that, um, that estrogen was something that every woman should have because menopause was awful, not because there, you know, yes, there were symptoms, but menopause represented a loss of femininity. Now we know that how a woman continues to look throughout her lifespan isn't actually affected by her estrogen levels. Uh, but that was, um, you know, if that's your, if that was at the time of society thinking that that's your currency, it's a very effective way to sell a product. And the reason this happened, this sort of switch from using hormones to treat symptoms to sort of maintain your femininity. In fact, even in the book talks about looking, you know, looking attractive in it, your tennis skirt. Right. Um, if you if you look back um, back at that sort of before before that time, estrogen was all like this. It was injections that were produced levels that would go up and down and and not not also very practical, right? You've got to go to the doctor's office to get this injection and it might help a little bit, but it might not actually be worth it. So what happened in the 1950s was um, formulations that allowed estrogen to be used um, in, uh, in ways orally that actually um, were you know, stable and produced stable levels and were far more palatable. And so um, the pharmaceutical companies made estrogen about glamour. And, um, and that actually allowed them to charge a lot more because people are wanting to pay more for a glamorous lifestyle. So that's kind of an interesting sort of, you know, run through of, of some of the history of the hormones, which is also in the book. And um, it wasn't just pharmaceutical companies, you know, making stuff up. I like to point out that there were plenty of people doing it. And the other thing that I found online is this bottle, which is Lydia Pinkham's vegetable compound, which I also talk about in the book. 
And in the late 1800s, Lydia Pinkham was the lady, I think in Maine, who came up with a compound that was gonna fix everything. It was a pat what's, what's called a patent medicine at the time, uh, kind of like our supplements of the day our supplements now. And this could cure everything. This could cure headaches. Um, you know, uh, when you felt fit for, you know, fit for nothing, when you had uterine prolapse, menstrual cramps, you could also, you know, fix your periods, which was code for an abortion. I mean, it was really gynecology in a bottle. And the claim was, um, was that the black cohosh in it was the thing that would, would treat menopausal symptoms. And actually when it was evaluated in, um, I think it was like 1911, around that time, they found that the only active ingredient in it was alcohol. So yeah, so if you sip alcohol all day long, um, you know, that, that was actually gonna help you. Now, um, the Lydia Pinkham's company didn't actually advertise that there was any alcohol in it. So I think that's a really kind of fascinating sort of um, backstory about that. And there's more information about it in the book. And so, you know, I really hope the book also helps people understand, you know, the history of hormones, how to decide if a hormone is appropriate for you, for your condition, also helps you sort of manage through some of the more difficult times uh, and, you know, and helps you advocate for yourself to get treatment. So I want to read um, another section here. I want to read a little bit about brain fog because that's a question that comes up a lot. Um, and then maybe we'll see, you know, kind of what questions happen afterwards. So um, let's see, where are we here? Okay. So like many women, I've forgotten my car keys or missed a meeting and then worried I had menopause brain. Surely this was the beginning of a rapid decline into forgotten hanky stuffed up my sleeve and in my bra. Approximately two thirds of women report these same cognitive difficulties during the menopause transition, meaning some kind of memory problem or forgetfulness. It's often commonly referred to as brain fog. Maybe it's a concern about misplaced keys, problems with word finding, or an inability to focus on a task. Several studies have looked at this phenomenon. For example, during the study of women's health across the nation, participants underwent tests of cognition and memory over several years, and these women were followed prospectively, an ideal way to follow changes as they occur. Women had a reduced speed at which they were able to process information, as well as a decrease in something called verbal episodic memory, which is the ability to recall a list of words or remember a story. These were subtle changes that didn't leave the women forgetful or unable to function. Rather, the researchers summed it up as an impact on the ability to take in new information. Another group of researchers compared women ages 45 to 55 with men of the same age and found women performed better than men with memory tasks before menopause. But during the menopause transition and afterwards, that advantage became less apparent. This point feels important enough to emphasize. Yes, there is a temporary change, but even with that change, women still outperformed men. The menopause changes in brain functioning are temporary and disappear once the menopause transition is over. This is an important point that I hope normalizes the experience and helps women feel reassured about what is happening. There can be a pause in learning, and in many ways, the menopause transition does feel like a break in your stride but it isn't a sign of deterioration. Perhaps a good analogy for the hormonal chaos the menopause transition of the menopause transition is like a computer uploading a new program. During the upload, the menopause transition, things run a little slower. Once loaded, there may be a glitch or two before this new program is running smoothly, and then things settle as the new program takes over. After all, both computer code and hormones are a form of languages a form of language. And so um, there's actually been some fascinating new data um, that comes out, uh, that came out this week that I wanna talk about related to brain fog, which obviously I couldn't put in the book because it just came out. Um, Dr. Lisa Moscone, who wrote the great book, Double X Brain, uh, actually um, is, you know, is a neuroscientist who studies um, the brain and women's health. And she has particular interest in menopause and dementia and Alzheimer's. And what her group did was uh, look at women's brains versus men's brains um, before menopause, during the menopause transition and afterwards. And what they found was during the menopause transition, there actually were changes it's important to note that estrogen actually helps, helps deliver glucose, sugar to the brain and helps with blood flow to parts of the brain. So it's an important sort of basically fertilizer for the brain, for lack of a better word. 
And so with the shifts in estrogen, there are changes. Some areas of the brain shrink and other areas of the brain don't function as well. And so you're starting to think, oh my gosh, oh, well, that's awful. But I want you to get back and remember the grandmothers, right? If menopause made us very non-functional, then it's unlikely it would have evolved the way that it did, okay? And so, um, and so I think that what we now know from Dr. Moscone's study is actually even more data to support the, the grandmother hypothesis because what happened over time is the brain adapted to this change of estrogen and other areas enlarged to compensate and other things happen to compensate. And so by the time menopause actually happened and you're through the menopause transition, you've now developed a workaround. So think about it again, like a switchboard, right? Like in the old days or, you know, like, the, well, probably most people watching have never seen a telephone switchboard. But um, if you think about the Lily Tomlin skit, um, you know, where she's like, you know, one ring eating and she's moving cords around, that basically that's what's happening in menopause. Your brain's rewiring itself so it can keep working. It really is like uploading that new program. And then the brain becomes as it was again, different, but um, still incredibly functional. And again, this really is just more evidence to support the grandma hypothesis. And if you're interested in hearing more about this study, I'm actually going to do an Instagram live tomorrow at 11 a.m. Pacific time, 2 a.m. Eastern time, actually with Dr. Dr. Moscone, who's the um, author of this study. So I've been talking for some time now, about 35 minutes. And so I think that it's uh, maybe time for me to um, answer some questions. Um, and so, uh, yeah, there we go. Hello. Hello. Um, thank you very much for that, uh, that conversation. Um, so I will invite people, if you have questions, we can answer them in the queue or enter them into the Q&A function. Um, a reminder too that um, Dr. Gunter is a doctor. Um, but uh, she won't be addressing very specific medical questions here today because um, it's just not the format that allows for that. Um, but uh, if you have general questions about the book, about the process, um, feel free to, to ask those and we're starting to uh, get them now. Um, so number one um and this is an important one is can we get signed copies um so i should say yes um so jen showed the american version of the book this is the beautiful canadian cover of the book this is available at novel idea and they actually do have a limited number of copies that have been signed um so you'll want to uh, hurry down there and get your copy to make sure that you can um, Karen also asks, why do I still feel like I go through the exact same monthly cycle except for the bleed? Um, so I can't really answer that question. Um, that really takes an exam and a lot of other information. It also depends on the person's age. Um, and so it's entirely possible if you're 45 or 46 or 47, um, that you may still be having cyclic changes in hormones, but it may not be enough to trigger a bleed from the lining of your uterus. Versus if you're 40, if you're 56 or 57, then I would say that it's not related to your reproductive hormones at all, and possibly another phenomenon. Um, you know, many medical conditions um, produce very similar symptoms to hormone fluctuation symptoms, and sometimes they appear to come once a month, but actually it's less sort of less cyclic than you think. There's also other rhythms in the brain and other things. And so um, that's kind of a general answer that I can give. Um, she also, I, I should say, uh, said, uh, thank you very much for this. And you have given words to express how she's feeling. Um, she's at four months without having a period and it is really lonely. So um, a thank you for, for this event. Um, so and Helga asks, so menopause is actually a superpower. Can you talk more about the advantages that accrue from menopause? Absolutely. You know, too often we just talk about the symptoms, uh, but there also are incredible advantages. So first of all, the advantage of not having a period. Um, 
many people have painful periods, have menstrual cramps, have um, menstrual diarrhea. You know, I had a lifelong of incredibly heavy periods, even on the birth control pill. If I wanted to go somewhere over the weekend and it was my period, my carry on luggage was like half filled with pads and tampons. So I have to tell you, not having a period is pretty awesome. You know, if you, um, if you're someone who sexual activity means that you have a risk of pregnancy, um, it is super nice that you don't have to worry about that at all ever. You know, I said, oh, did I take my pill? Did I, uh, you know, that type of thing. So those are really nice. Also, you know, I think that, um, whether this is age or menopause, you know, you're sort of finally at the point where you're like, you know, like fuck it. You know, I'm just like, I, I, I think it gives you kind of this liberation from the patriarchy, which I wish I had at a younger age. I don't think like, I mean, even though I was, you know, I would have to say, you know, I've, I've been a lifelong feminist. I think that this has even pushed me more in one direction um, because it sort of gives you a clarity, I think, kind of looking back and you sort of look at everything that you've been through and, um, and then you see how you're being judged now. And I think it sort of gets a lot of people sort of to, to speak up even louder. Uh, and once you get through the menopause transition for most people, things really settle down. And I'd like to, you know, uh, sort of draw the analogy between puberty and the menopause transition and things are pretty rocky, right? Like during puberty, nobody would say, boy, I hope I feel like this for the rest of my life, right? But then things settle out and you become an adult and you, you know, um, you gain some things, you lose some things. So, you know, you gain periods, which might be sucky for some people, but, but not so much for others. Um, you know, you, and then same with menopause, you gain some things, you lose a few things and, and that's kind of life. Um, but the, tr the menopause transition doesn't go on forever. Um, so I have a question, uh, from Tanya and she said, uh, the historical overview you presented was in general terms, a Western view of menopause. Have you come across different perspectives from other cultures? So, um, in, uh, so traditional Chinese medicine didn't, um, consider menopause to be a thing. There's absolutely no reference to it at all. It wasn't, um, the, they, so many cultures use kind of the phase of life. Um, and that's, you know, that's uh, basically as women, as women aged and they lost their periods, men aged and they got scanty sperm. And so I think that's a really important concept because whenever anyone says that they're going to use a traditional Chinese medicine practice for menopause, then that is not a traditional Chinese medicine practice. There were no traditional treatments for hot flushes or joint pains or anything like that because that wasn't a condition to be treated. Right. So if someone's offering you, for example, acupuncture for hot flushes, they're offering you a modern version. They're not offering you a traditional therapy because it just it, it's just not referenced in the tech in the ancient text at all. Um, so I think that's an important concept. So, you know, how how menopause is treated sort of in in Western medicine was sort of really reflective of just kind of how women were treated in Western medicine, right? So they were considered lesser, everything revolved around fertility. And so, um, yeah, so there's, in, in, so that, that's the best that I can do. And there's a really good book, um, A Flourishing Yin, um, that, um, you know, that I use sort of for some of the reference and um, which, you know, really sort of explains how everything that sort of offered today as, as sort of ancient um, and sort of Chinese types of ancient Chinese medicine or traditional Chinese medicine for, for menopause, what is taking the Western concept of menopause and then applying it, um, uh, you know, uh, to, um, to sort of Chinese medicine and then coming up with a new thing. Um, I have a, a question that came from our social media, um, and it's broad, um, but uh, it is, what would you love patients to know, or at least have a basic knowledge of before they come to see you? Oh, I think how the menstrual cycle works. Uh, I think that, that we do a really bad job of explaining that to people in general. Um, you know, schools basically offer almost no, you know, their, their sex education is pregnancy prevention. Um, it's all, and it's all presented sort of from a sort of a purity culture, generally standpoint. It's nothing useful. Um, I mean, most people can learn about birth control if they need it from other sources. But I really wish people knew more just kind of basic biology about how everything works, because that would really not only empower people, but it would really vaccinate them against a lot of the misinformation online. Like for example, you read all the time, all these people who have claim that they can help you balance your hormones. Well, that's not a thing. It's not a medical thing at all. And if, if those people had any understanding of 
you know, physiology, they wouldn't be using that term. But if no one's ever explained to you how your hormones work, or your ovaries work, or your menstrual cycle works, you would be very vulnerable to terms like hormone imbalance or estrogen dominance, which are, you know, made up in basically fairy tales. Um, Bonnie has one for you that's just, how do you balance your writing and medical careers in your life? How do you stay well yourself? Uh, ooh, um, well, you know, I just take the candle and chop it up into 20 pieces and burn both ends. <laughs> Um, you know, I, I, I'm striving for more balance now. Um, I had a very busy year with, you know, recording a podcast, body stuff, which actually, um, I would encourage everybody to listen to because one, it's amazing and it's free and it will teach you about your physiology. In fact, we go through ovarian physiology in the third episode, but I also got to interview Dr. Kristen Hawks, who is the anthropologist who was the leader behind the grandmother hypothesis. And so that was incredibly amazing to talk to this like kick-ass woman about this kick-ass research she did that really, you know, sort of put all of sort of patriarchal anthropology on end, you know, and I actually, when I read um, some of her initial papers, the responses, you know, from other anthropology, they, it's very interesting how anthropology literature is or was at the time and how these like long responses, how it wasn't true. And what about the men hunter gatherers and all this stuff? And it was like, and she had explanations for every one of them. She's like, well, actually hunting only brought in 3% of the family calories. So it really was the grandmother doing the collection. Um, big game hunting actually was a value, but not for an individual family. They didn't get the calories from that. It ele probably elevated your status in society. And then that protected your family unit, right? You have a higher social status, but it wasn't feeding your family directly grandmothers were actually feeding the family directly. Um, so, you know, it's really fascinating. Anyway, so if you want to hear her voice, it's super cool. I recommend that. And just, we just got a comment that said, hail to the grandmothers. <laughs> well, I also like to point out, you know, that, that today, not all grandmothers are useful. Certainly my own mother was an awful grandmother. Um, and so, you know, I wouldn't want anyone to think that they're worth is dependence on being a grandmother or being a mother. Um, this is a this is sort of to look at how we got here, um, and so I think it's important to separate the two. And I'd also like to say it's because of our ancestral grandmothers that we have the big brains that we do. So we're able to evolve beyond our reproductive function if we want to. If we want to not have children, if you know, we have contraception, if that's what we need, if we want to have assisted reproduction, that's all from our big brains. And it's having a grandmother to assist with all of the sort of the kludgy aspect of human biology that requires delivering a big headed baby through a small pelvis. And so grandmothers gave us our brains today. And so that means to me, we should use our brains how we want to and I'll use our bodies how we want. Um, we have a few people asking, uh, uh, questions about diet and omega threes and things like that. So I just wondered if you could, um, sort of explain, because you do talk a, a lot about this in the book, but, um, just sort of a breakdown of what kind of information is included in the book and what kind they might have to speak specifically to their, their personal or their OBGYN about. Yeah, so there's a rundown of kind of some basic questions that I get asked a lot about diet in there, some dietary basics, and what's the most important thing to have. Um, you know, uh, there's data on omega-3s in there, absolutely, and um, on calcium and vitamin D, also vitamin B12. And so, you know, and uh, on different diets, you know, what we consider to be the best diet, um, you know, it's generally the, you know, anything that's a heart healthy diet is going to be your best diet for menopause because the number one killer of women is heart disease. Okay. One in three women will die from heart disease. So the healthiest diet for a woman is a heart healthy diet. And it's probably the healthiest diet for any person is a heart healthy diet. Cause that's, you know, probably one of the number one killers. So, um, you know, so I think that's a really important thing to consider, you know, a healthy diet can come in a lot of different shapes and forms. So you can have a healthy vegan diet, you can have a healthy pescatarian diet, you can have a healthy diet where you have red meat. 
it, you know, it depends on a lot of, you know, it depends on your the calorie consumption and depends on saturated fat. Those are probably two of the biggest ones. And so there's a lot of information about that in there. Um, and, you know, information about milk and dairy um, also, which is also another episode of the podcast, by the way, which is called Body Stuff. That's episode four is all on bones. And um, I actually talk with another super cool anthropologist who um, studies our co-evolution with dairy. Um, so it's really fascinating uh, to sort of understand how so many different cultures um, were able to survive all around the world using different methods of collecting food. And I think that's um, a really good point is that a lot of people, you know, say, oh, well, isn't um, a traditional Japanese diet the healthiest? That's what I've heard. I've heard about soy. That's what a lot of people have heard about. There's a lot of information about that in the book. And um, basically, no, uh, switching to a high soy diet is is not going to improve any symptoms in menopause. What people forget when they sort of focus on like one food is that food comes with a whole diet, right? So, you know, that when you look at a traditional Japanese diet, for example, well, there's lots of fatty fish and there's lots of vegetables and, um, and there's not a lot of ultra processed foods. And so it's got them, it's, it's a generally high quality diet. Right. And the other thing is, well, look, you know, people in the Mediterranean area, they also live a super long time and they have a heart healthy diet weight. They don't have any phytoestrogens in their diet really at all. They have no soy. So you have people in Japan living very long, healthy lives with lots of soy and people in the Mediterranean living very long, healthy lives with no soy. But, you know, what's the similarity between those diets? whole grains, vegetables, fatty fish. And so um, soy can be a very healthy part of a diet, but it doesn't have to be. Um, but diets high in soy, adding it into your diet doesn't seem to make a difference. And I do spend a lot of time discussing that in the book. Um, I have a question from uh, Janice. Also, there were a bunch of people asking about the podcast. So we we have linked to it in the chat. Thank you. Um, yeah, because uh, I know people are going to want to hear more. Um, so Janice asks, uh, for vaginal moisturizers, the book mentions some ingredients that can be helpful, such as hyaluronic acid and silicone. Could you speak to the pros and cons of some of these ingredients? So, um, so there isn't really a pro and con versus silicone and hyaluronic acid. They're different choices. It's like Coke and Pepsi. Um, well, maybe not. Maybe like Coke and Sprite. Um, so they're both sodas, but, you know, they're a little bit different. And so, you know, uh, they're, they're both fairly well tested. They're, um, you know, neither of them are associated with risks of yeast infections or irritation. Obviously, personal feel is a big thing. And some people like the feel of one versus another. Uh, they do the same thing in different ways. And so, you know, um, how something feels, especially sexually, is very user dependent, right? Some people love the feel of one thing, other people hate it. Like I personally can't stand the feel of water-based loops. I don't know how people even use those. I like, I find them repulsive. And other people are like, ew, how do you can't, how, why do you use silicone? That's so gross. So, you know, we all have things that we, we like the feel of on our skin. And so I would say that, you know, they're just hyaluronic acid and silicone are gonna give you different feels, um, but they're both very good. And um, there isn't really an advantage of one versus the other. So usually what I say to people um, is, you know, look at the application method. So some of them come in like ovules that you pop in, others are sort of um, tubes where you inject, you know, inject the, the, the moisturizer into the vagina, like choose the application method that you think, you know, is gonna be the easiest for you or choose the one that you think is the most cost effective. Um, there's also some water-based moisturizers too. Um, some of them tend to have higher osmolality and so you do have to be careful about that. So what osmolality is, is a high osmolality can pull water out of your cells and actually be irritating to the tissues. And so because water-based lubes and moisturizers don't have that information on the packages and you know recipes change all the time you you can't i can't actually tell someone well i can absolutely for sure guarantee you that this moisturizer is always going to be in the right osmolality range and so you don't have to worry about osmolality with um with most of the hyaluronic acid products or with silicone at all and so those way those are kind of like the easy no-brainer ones to suggest but again it's personal and if you find one that you really like and it works for you okay um, well, amazingly, we're already um, near the end of our time. Um, I know we do have a, a bunch of other questions here, so I apologize that we can't get to all of them. But I think a nice one uh, to finish off with, um, uh, you talked about um, some of the um, 
the benefits of, of menopause or some of the, the pluses, but someone asks, um, how can we embrace menopause without fear? Well, I think knowledge, I think knowing what's happening to your body, not listening to what the patriarchy tells you about it. And this is an answer I know a lot of people aren't gonna wanna hear is exercise. If there's only one thing you could pick to do for your menopause, I would choose exercise. I would choose it over hormones. I would choose it over anything. It is the thing that will um, prevent cardiac disease, prevent osteoporosis, um, reduce your risk of diabetes, um, help you sleep better, reduce your risk of dementia, Alzheimer's. It's kind of one of those things that touches every cell. And it's hard. It sucks. I mean, I, I exercise regularly and I have never once had a runner's high. I have never once gone for a run and been in the middle of the run and gone, oh, I'm embracing the joy. I hate every fucking step, every step. When I do weights, which I do regularly three times a week, I hate every fucking rep, but I love the health benefit. And it's taken me some time to separate the looks that we have traditionally associated with exercise and the health benefit. And now I think about it just for health. And I don't like taking a pill either, but I do it if I need to, right? And so actually, believe it or not, this has been a better way for me to accept exercise. I literally think about it as medication. This is prescribed medication that is you know, largely free and, um, and is gonna help multiple organ systems. And you know, it'll, help, um, it'll help offset some of that um, abdominal weight gain that can happen during menopause, which is not important because of how it changes looks, but because that can actually be a risk factor for heart disease and diabetes and other things. And so, yeah, exercise is like the most, and it, specifically weightlifting and resistance. So building muscle mass, because during the menopause transition, we have a rapid loss of muscle mass. And um, that sets us up for a lot of these changes that increase our, um, our health risks. And also as women generally live longer than men and they start with less muscle mass, you have to go longer with less. And that's why a lot of women end up so frail is because they've lost so much muscle mass. And that's why um, a, you know, a lot of other um, medical conditions can be traced to that as well. So exercise, I know I hate to say it because I hate to hear it myself and I hear it, but yeah, that's the one thing you can do to embrace it. Well, um, I want to thank you so much. Um, you know, it's a delight. I'm so glad we uh, had the opportunity to have you here before and very pleased to welcome you back and can't wait for your next book. Um, uh, so thank you to, to Dr. Gunter. Um, a quick reminder again that Dr. Dr. Gunter's books are available for sale at Novel Idea. We had somebody ask, yes, they do mail to other provinces. So if you're not in Kingston, you still can get a copy. Um, just look up Novel Idea Kingston or Novel Idea Bookstore online and you'll find them that way. Um, again, if you haven't already done so, make sure you sign up for our mailing list to get a first look at our exciting 2021 lineup and creative, as well as a peek at some of the authors you can look forward to this fall. Um, so for now, stay safe, so stay well, and thank you again. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thanks.